So, we're down to two candidates who none of us have a strong objection to. I'm really not happy about either of them, but I don't think there's anyone I could be happy about condemning to total isolation for the rest of their probably very brief life, even when they insist they want it. But I think these two can handle it better than most. I've wondered if we ought to be sending two people to give each other company. Why send two people to their deaths when we can accomplish the goal with one? And they'd go through the water and rations twice as fast. We don't have the mass margin to double them. So, how should we pick which one? Just put it to a quick vote? No, we've got to be careful about this. Let's interview them. Look, I'm really busy with all the observations I have to make of the Tau Ceti system and the oncoming asteroid. We can do them both at once. A three-on-two panel interview won't take long. Well, I suppose. Agreed. QuietPlease.org presents 253 Matilda. In the early 22nd century, the crewed asteroid 253 Matilda left the solar system on an interstellar mission. Generations later, after 114 years, a new star system stretches out in front of them. Episode 11, Natural Selection. Mayor, to what do we owe the pleasure? Have you two uncovered anything new about the artifact? A few things. We've determined it runs on gallium nitride transistors with trinary gates. Even leading experts on Earth would probably need years to understand the programming. We don't have years. We have three weeks before its friends arrive. Does it appear to have any offensive capabilities besides electrocuting you, Amadi? It's peaceful. You seem sure of yourself. I am. I'm not so sure. I think we should disable it. No! If you try to remove it, who knows what could happen? It might blow up! So it's absolutely peaceful, but it'll kill us if we try to stop it. Have I got that right, Amadi? Uh, well, all I know is we've got to leave it alone! Detective C-Tang, have the antenna disconnected. Whatever it's doing, I don't think we need it coordinating with the oncoming asteroid any longer. You're making a big mistake! I also want you two to draw up plans to repel a potential invasion. It'll help to know what form the invasion will take. How many of them there are, what they're armed with, what their goals are. Sure would. And in your own words, and please keep them under a minute, what do you think makes you the ideal candidate for this mission? Sergei Kochergan? I have some medical training, so I'll be able to recognize and treat some potential problems. I attempt the wild in hydroponics, so I've got a head start on growing my own food. And I spent some time as a mech too, so I can keep the equipment running. I'm kind of a jack of all trades, and that's what you need when you can only send one person. And you, Marcus Flint. I work hard. I don't expect much from life, and I'm prepared for things to get rough. I've never really gotten along with people anyway. I can thrive on solitude. You can get along without me, and I can get along without you. Old enough, it's no tragedy when I die, but young enough, I can handle the stresses and get along without any medicines for a few years. What I'd like to know is, why do either of you want to do this? Who could resist being the first person to explore strange new worlds, to discover new life? Maybe even civilizations. What else is left for me? My daughters hate me, my boss barely tolerates me, and nobody else gives me the time of day. I figure this is my last chance to make something of my life, and a sacrifice that can help make up for some mistakes. Okay, thank you both for coming in. You can go now. We'll let you know by tomorrow. Remember, whichever of you isn't picked will continue training as a contingency option.
I worry Sergei Kocherkin hasn't really figured himself out yet. He tries something and tires of it and wants to move on to the next thing. He's young. He wants this right now, but how do we know if he'll keep on wanting it? His zeal concerns me. I don't think you can do a lifelong mission like this because you're excited about exploration and discovery because the exploration and discovery are just the dramatized clips for the newsreel. The reality is going to be years of tedium and loneliness. On the other hand, Sergei has all the skills he needs and an aptitude for learning more and a good attitude. I can see him handling unexpected situations and staying flexible. Flint, well, to be polite, Flint isn't one of our best or brightest. Hard to believe his daughters are related to him. He's barely been in their lives. That's why they turned out okay. Flint is stubborn and jaded, but I don't know, maybe that worked to his advantage. His psyche is already scarred over. But is he the sort of person we want representing humanity? I mean, this could be the only human some alien species ever meets. Do we want to send somebody who's kind of a jerk? Might be better than sending someone who's insane by the time he arrives. We do not have an arsenal. We cannot arm everyone. But we will share what we have on the condition that it all be returned immediately once the threat has passed. Let's hope they aren't bringing an army. At least we've cut their intel signal now. I feel the strongest intuition that the device was just here to monitor and keep things safe. Like, maybe they're the galactic police. <laughs> and you think that means we're safe? Doesn't it? Not if we've been breaking their laws. And them pulling us over suggests we have been. Breaking the cosmic speed limit. That might be exactly what we are doing. What? Think about it. The speed at which we are now moving makes us a weapon of mass destruction. If we wished to, we could destroy entire planets with just small chunks of 253 Matilda. And there is no defense against us. Well, if that's what they're here about, we should just let them board so they can verify our good intentions. We need to prove our good faith, not point weapons at them. On Earth, when your police catch a citizen in possession of a nuclear weapon, do they let him keep it after verifying that he seems like a nice guy and says he will not use it? I'm with the Ambassador on this one. Your serve, Dad. Another one for me. Have you made your decision yet, Dad? Which volunteer to make our ambassador to Tau Ceti? <sighs> I think so, but I'm not sure if it really feels right. What do you mean? Oh. Well, on the one hand, I've got a highly enthusiastic, highly qualified young man who can handle anything we throw at him. Oh. On the other hand, I've got a whiny old codger who sees the mission more as a penance than a reward. Sounds like an easy decision. Game point, my serve. You think so? Trouble is, the more I think about it, the more certain I am that we've got to send the whiny old codger. Why's that? How can we condemn someone to permanent expulsion who doesn't really understand what he's getting into? <laughs> Sergei thinks it's a fun adventure. Who knows how he'll handle it when he discovers the endless hardship and it's too late to change his mind. I see your point. Speaking of which, game point to me. wasn't a fair contest. You have way more experience playing hoverball in natural gravity. Oh, that was a long time ago. Still, you remember how the ball moves and how to use the ceiling. I barely played before the acceleration kicked in. Took me a few years as mayor and a failed marriage to realize you need to play to let off steam. It was easier back then. <laughs> 
I'm exhausted. Thank you all for coming out today. I know many of you have questions about our Tau SETI mission. Please hang on to those to ask after the presentations if the presenters don't cover it. First, let me introduce Astronomy Chief Lawrence with a quick overview of the system we'll be exploring. Rather than just describe the Tau SETI system, let me show it to you. What you're seeing here is the grand overview all 12 planets, 87 known moons, the dust belt, the scattered disk. Not to scale, or most of the planets and all the moons would be too small for you to see anything of. Each of these worlds is fascinating in its own right, and we could spend a lifetime studying any of them. Unfortunately, we can't. So we've prioritized the worlds that appear capable of supporting life, including, hopefully, the life of our volunteer explorer. Three of the planets are sub-Neptune gas giants. Let's zoom in on one of them. The biggest of these moons you're looking at is Mars-sized, has a nitrogen-oxygen atmosphere, and what appears to be extensive plant life. It's outside the traditional conception of the habitable zone, but appears to be kept just warm enough thanks to tidal heating and greenhouse gases, a very high methane concentration which may have volcanic and biological contributions. We've named this moon Eddington. Because of the small gravity well, Eddington will be our ship's initial and hopefully final destination. But if our volunteer judges the prospects of survival on Eddington as too dim, there's the super-Earth originally known as Tau Ceti F. We've renamed that as Miranda. At about four Earth masses, landing on Miranda is a one-way trip, and the gravity will present problems for our explorer. Fortunately, everything else we've been able to gather about the planet has been promising. There are oceans, continents, plant life, and several controversial pockets of light on the night side which may represent cities, but might also be some sort of land-based bioluminescence on a scale not known on Earth. It remains to be seen what we'll find, and that's why we're going. So without further ado, I'd like to introduce you all to the one of us who will be going in person, whose mission reports will be hanging on every word of. Please welcome Marcus Flint. I know none of you like me much. That's okay. You don't need to. I'm honored to carry this responsibility on behalf of the human race. And of course, I'll be keeping you updated on everything I've learned. I'm not one for speeches, so let me leave it at that and turn you over to Mission Specialist Peters, who's going to tell you a little about my ship and flight profile. Thank you, Marcus. I've poured the last few years of my life into this ship, which is designed entirely around one principle, figuring out how to get our current velocity of three quarters of the speed of light down to almost nothing as quickly as possible. As quickly as possible turned out to be about a month and a half at an average acceleration of five Gs. To achieve that, We've created a tiny ship which at launch time will dock with a gigantic tanker, two orders of magnitude larger than the ship. The g-forces Marcus has to endure, what we colloquially refer to as gravity, even though it's a different phenomenon, will gradually increase as the ship-tanker combo becomes lighter. We plan to insert the ship into an orbit around Eddington, then leave the vast majority of the remaining fuel up there in orbit a cache to use for a potential trip to Miranda later. Just the ship will descend to the surface of Eddington, using aero braking to limit fuel consumption, retaining just enough fuel to make it back to orbit if required. Now, to explain how we'll keep Marcus alive once he lands, here's Chief Sanders. Thank you. Surviving the fantastic accelerations will be the easy part. The hard part will be staying alive on an alien world. Water should be easy to source on Eddington or Miranda, but food is an entirely different matter. We don't know if what plants may be growing there have any nutritional value for a human, though we're including lab equipment to determine that and whether they're poisonous. Accordingly, we've given a lot of thought to a collection of seeds we're sending with it. 
we've included plants that thrive in various conditions and that fulfill very nutritional needs, in the hopes that he can get enough of them to take root. Of course, he'll have a searchable library of ebooks and hollows to help him learn the farming skills he'll need. If some condition unknown to us prevents any of our seeds from growing, and the native plants aren't edible, then I'm afraid Marcus only has about eight months until the dehydrated ration packs run out. But probably only a week before I'm totally sick of them. <laughs> <laughs> we can take a few questions now. Yes, you in the second row? Don't they say Miranda is too young to have developed intelligent life? It's considerably older than Earth, but I think what you're referring to is that Miranda has only been in the habitable zone for about a billion years. Can intelligent life evolve in that short a time? Nobody knows. All we know is it took four billion years on Earth, and the ambassadors say it took three billion on their planet. This is one of the big questions we're hoping to find the answer to. What about Tau Ceti's huge dust belt? Wouldn't that make it hard for complex life? Tau Ceti is a very active system, with ten times the cometary and asteroidal material of Earth's sun, and no Jupiter-sized planets in the system. We expect Eddington and Miranda have been subject to many bombardments which could have complicated the evolution of life. Then again, nothing speeds up evolution like a crisis, and humanity might never have evolved without the KT event wiping out the dinosaurs. Perhaps we'll find they've evolved faster because of their extinction events. Or maybe Eddington is sufficiently protected by its planets, or Miranda by its thick atmosphere. We'll just have to wait and see. This one is for Chief Sanders. Isn't introducing seeds from Earth to an alien planet a serious act of environmental destruction? You can certainly view it that way. But we decided keeping Marcus Flint alive is more important than preserving the biosphere the way we find it. The plan does call for him to land on an isolated island or continent in hopes that the rest of the world won't be affected. But really, we think native plants are likely to outcompete anything adapted to Earth, so the real problem will be keeping our crops from being overrun. This question's from Marcus Flint. Mr. Flint, were you planning on telling your daughters you'd been selected, or were you hoping to sneak away before we'd notice? Thought I'd keep it a surprise until the presentation, so I could see the look of pure joy and pride on your face right now. <laughs> if we must treat them as a threat, our defense should focus on protecting generators. Why is that? If they knock out the generators, our air and heat could go out, and then they've won. I suppose but I think it's more likely they'll want to capture us undamaged, or they'd just keep their distance and destroy us with relativistic kinetic weapons. I think it's more likely they don't want to hurt us at all, but we're not allowed to plan for that scenario. They could disable the generators temporarily to force a surrender if we don't defend them. Okay, you have a point there. Can we help you? Thought I'd come help you strategize our defense. Gee, thanks. If we get overrun by a superior force, we'll need fallback positions with good cover to hide a while and regroup. Hard to hide on an asteroid where so few places have oxygen. There's the storage levels. Bit of a labyrinth. Lots of containers to hide behind are inside. Area B-12 is a good strategic position. You should consider caching some weapons and ammo there just in case. Do we have enough weapons to be caching some? It's mainly extra power packs and explosives we'll need to cache. We'll bring the laser rifles with us as we retreat. A few extra rifles in reserve would be smart too, though. Considering how likely it is that we'll be overpowered, either we'll stop them by the airlock or we'll be fighting an insurgency. There's not much chance for something in between. Not a bad idea. I'll go take care of it. I didn't mean right this minute. Is it my imagination, or is Amadi acting stranger than usual lately? Marcus Flint, you made it quick. What have I been sent here for, Doctor? 
Drop your pants, please. Excuse me? I have your first injection ready. Needs to go in your posterior. Injection of what? I thought somebody would have told you. Apparently not. This will help your body cope with the extreme g-forces of your last month of deceleration. You'll be getting one every other day. I'll be sending a supply with you to inject yourself after the launch. Oh. I was kind of wondering how I was going to survive that. With that other asteroid coming after us, you might be the only one of us who does survive. Thanks, Doc. You always buy that silver lining. But that's not how an invader thinks! So glad you're here to provide me with perfect insight into the minds of aliens you've never met. Excuse me? Yes, what is it, Chief Flint? I'm looking for my husband. He's not here? He ran off to some storage area to hide some ordnance for a fallback plan. B-12. Thanks. So, Detective, do you really think it's likely they're going to... Hey, Larissa, what's Please up? Please your destination. I heard Dad got picked for the mission. Storage area B-12. What? Not to you. Yeah, I was there at the presentation. I hope he doesn't back out at the last second and leave us in a bind. Sergey better stay ready to step in. You're so lucky. Dad being picked means it's going to be my job to talk to him all the time for months until we're out of range. That does sound awful. Gotta go. I'll call you back later. Arash, I wanted to... Wait, what are you doing? Why are you destroying those weapon power packs? Put your hands in the air, Marissa. Now! Honey, you're pointing a gun at your wife. You better have one hell of a persuasive explanation. And have it now. I can't let you tell anyone about this. Wrong answer. Toss your multicom to the ground. I don't want to hurt you, but I will if you interfere with my mission. Your mission? But- Now! They can't track you now. Let's go. You first. I have a place in mind. Down those stairs and to the right. Arash, what's happening to you? It's like you've become a different person. I have a higher calling now. Sabotage and kidnapping are higher. I think you have your directions confused. By disabling the weapons, I'm preventing violence, saving lives. Alien lives. In here. Nobody comes down here. You won't be able to attract anyone's attention. I've got the door lock on manual, and the area isn't hooked up to the voice access systems, so it'll take them a long time to discover you. Especially with you leading the search. I'll bring you food and water every day. I have no wish to see you or anyone else harmed unnecessarily. Rash, if I ever get out of here. You've been listening to 253 Matilda, Episode 11, Natural Selection. Created, written, produced, and directed by Paul Neerham. Mission Specialist Salish Peters is David Loftus. Mayor Renata Matumbo is Kathleen Lee. Astronomy Chief Lawrence is James Lorenz. Marcus Flint is Glenn Haskell. Detective Aranya Satang is Sova Rain. Detective Arash Amadi is Paul Neeram. Chief Mech Larissa Flint is Lindsay Townsend. The Mayor's father is Roger Arnold. Ambassador One is Microsoft Azure Neural Voice Eric. Dr. Stone is John Gauntz. 
Dr. Peters, is Ahmad A.J. Judah. Communications Chief Marissa Flint is Virginia Hargrove. The questioners are Allison Prophet and Corey V.A. Sergei Kochergan is Alexander Grace. The computer is Microsoft Azure Neural Voice Jenny. Chief Botanist Juliana Saunders is Aaron Summonsby. The announcer is Aaron Summonsby. Special thanks to our Kickstarter backer, Sergei Kochergan. Sound effects and music courtesy freesound.org, asoundeffect.com, freepd.com, and audionautics.com. This program is licensed for free reuse and redistribution. Hear more episodes at quietplease.org slash 253.